program number 106. Three, two, one. Here's an eyewitnesser to one of the worst hit parts of the country in this year's drought. Don Mack, for Here's Info, talked to Pete Lorenz, regional grain manager for the NFO in Kansas, Colorado, and Oklahoma. Pete, Kansas has been hit with the drought. Uh, how serious is this drought in that state? A number of people that I've talked to said that this is the worst drought that, that they've seen since the 30s. I talked to an old-timer this week that said that he lived through the 30s and it wasn't this dry then. Uh, we've got probably the worst crop that the state has ever had. I mean, there are large areas of wheat that never came up, or if it did come up, it died. Uh, there's just absolutely no moisture at all. What kind of projections are being made? USDA just recently a report that uh, predicted a 202 million bushel crop in Kansas, and I'd have to say that that's pretty optimistic. Now, that report was based on May 1st conditions. There's a Joel Martin who works for the Extension Service at Fort Hayes State University, and he projected a crop at 150 to 175 million bushels, and in my opinion, that's probably pretty close to right. Uh, how does it affect the cow herds? The western two-thirds of Kansas, uh, the feed supplies have dwindled to almost nothing. Uh, pastures that normally green up this time of the year are, are brown. In fact, uh, there's been a large number of grass fires in the state of Kansas. Uh, there's just no feed left, and there's a lot of cattle moving to market, moving out of state. I know Senator uh, Dole was out uh, about a month ago, and at that time he remarked that that's the worst he's ever seen in the wheat country. And it's just unbelievable. Unless you see it, you just can't believe how dry it is. We had a dirt storm in the first part of May, and, and uh, it reminded people of the 30s. And what about law of supply and demand? At this point, there's a lot of farmers are beginning to doubt the marketing system that, that farmers market under today because they can look out at a field that's bare, and they're beginning to wonder why the price of wheat isn't 2 or $3 a bushel higher. Uh, the supply of wheat is getting critically tight, I think tighter than the government will admit. And the prospects for a crop in this country this year are diminishing every day because there is a large area of the wheat country that is dry. Pete, uh, just exactly how can farmers affect the market? Well, with supplies of grain as tight as they are, it does put the farmer in a better position to bargain for, for his commodity. And if the farmers would take the time to market as a group, uh, they have the opportunity to affect the market through collective bargaining or through programs like the National Farmers Organization has. Don Mack interviewing Pete Lorenz, Grain Man, and Eyewitness to the Drought. Phil Allen for Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about. Number 107, 3, 2, 1. Today we have Steve Halloran, who is head of the Grain Department for National Farmers Organization. Uh, Steve is going to talk about something in the grain department which uh, has existed quite a long time called PSP. That's a producer service program, the kind of service that the NFO gives to grain growers. So what kind of service are we talking about? We feel that producers out there of grain have to uh, acknowledge the fact that they spend most of their time or should spend most of their time as production managers. And as a result of that, and they are outstanding production managers, but as a result of that, they find themselves given not enough time to service their marketing needs themselves. Okay. And, and I think most of them admit that, don't they? I think so, if they're really honest with themselves. And that's the service we render for the producer. We suggest to them that uh, we have the time and, and know-how to, to watch the markets for them, and to, to market into the ups uh, that the markets occasionally give us and to avoid at uh, any cost marketing into the drops. And that will result in them uh, having a disciplined marketing plan that will put them in the top uh, third of the market. I wish all the grain growers in the country could see the access that you folks in the NFO Grain Department have to the markets, second by second. You know what it's, what's going on, don't you? Well, I think we do. We call it sell-side information as opposed to buy-side information. Okay, We're the sellers. Uh, the buyers tend to dominate the information that producers hear. How do you get that service to the 
NFO members who are in this program? What we're offering, Phil, is, is for new subscribers to this program, three months free subscription on Dataline or DTN, and uh, they will, uh, for $700, they will be able to market 10,000 bushels with no, uh, no expense, uh, further expense for 10,000 bushels, and above that, it would be a nominal fee of a nickel a bushel. But they will receive three pages daily on DTN of sell side information, uh, information that will counter the buy side bias that they're confronted with daily. How do they get in touch if they're interested? Can either call us, uh, our 800 number for information, or they can call their area reps. Okay, the representative of the NFO in the in the area. That's right. I've been talking with Steve Halloran, director of the Grain Department, National Farmers Organization. Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that, for today, is something to think about. Number 108, 3, 2, 1. Joe Paris, Director of Dairy Operations for the eastern part of the United States, has an update for us on growth in NFO volume nationwide just between February and March. We marketed milk for 101 more producers than we had in February. We also handled 28 million more pounds of milk. Now, to give you an idea of the size of that increase, that was 560 tanker loads more than we handled in February, or 18 tankers per day. Now, that kind of growth rate, if we can continue that, certainly is going to have an impact on prices. Joe Paris notes industry predictions earlier this year for lower prices based on the Minnesota-Wisconsin series price, or what handlers will pay for manufacturing grade milk. We've been hearing predictions from the industry that the Minnesota-Wisconsin series price could go as low as $10.40 a hundredweight by July. So in order to offset that and to bring into being phase three of the Enough is Enough program, we are going out in May, June, and July, and with grade B producers that come on our milk truck, new milk, uh, for those three months, we will be putting out a price of a minimum of $11 in order to floor that M&W series price at about that $11 level. Uh, or they'll get the previous month's M&W plus 10 cents or the current M&W plus 10 cents. Now what this program is designed to do is to set a floor at $11 by basing off of the previous month's M&W for that May, June, and July. It puts a target price out for plants to shoot at in those targeted areas uh, about 25 days in advance of paying those producers. And by going with the current month and 10 cents, if that's the greatest price, then uh, that gives the producer the ability to take advantage of any ups in the market and put continued pressure on during that three month period. And a pricing concept that will benefit both handlers and producers. As you look at some of the things going on in government and the talk of lower support prices, to be able to uh, replace government support type pricing with floor prices and to take the the ups and downs out of that market put stability in there with escalator clauses that as the market price go up then the floor prices go up this is a concept that has benefits to the handler it certainly has benefits to the producers but putting his income at more stable levels but the handler can benefit from it because he knows that producers then can stay in business and it's a step forward to our cost of production plus a profit at some point in the future. A report from Joe Paris, Director of Dairy Operations for the NFO in the Eastern States. Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 109. Three, two, one. When a Walmart store was scheduled to come into the town of Creston, Iowa, a population about 7,000, Professor Ken Stone of Iowa State University Extension Division said that, yes, the trade area increases when a Walmart comes in. Some service businesses do better, such as restaurants. But in the line of fire of a Walmart store, the business drops off at least 10 percent, he said. And there are certain things you can do to cope with it. I'm talking now with Gary Thompson of the longtime Thompson Electric in Corning, Iowa, and John McMahon of McMahon's Drugstore. Why would a local businessman advertise less, Gary? 
probably like shooting yourself in the foot. When you see your dollar start shrinking, I'd say the first thing I, that most will look to give up would probably be advertising. You know, they can't cut back on insurance or taxes or rent and maybe save a little on employment. When you look in the paper and see a product maybe being sold for less than you are and you look at your, your dollar shrinking, uh, that 2 to 3 percent you should be spent on advertising could be the first thing to go. And after about 30 years, I know it's sometimes we as small businessmen don't advertise nearly enough. We get busy. Uh, the big ones like Walmart have full-time account executives who do the advertising for them. Uh, we're too busy fighting little fires to remember what it takes to make our business grow. Gary Thompson of Thompson Electric Radio Shack. Turn now to John McMahon of McMahon's Drug Store. What's your feeling about that? Well, Phil, it can be pretty intimidating to see the efforts that Walmart puts out in promotion and advertising. Their ability to uh, sort merchandise at uh, premium prices or at real promotional prices, excuse me, uh, tends to make it quite difficult for a local independent to uh, match that effort. And a lot of times, if you feel like you can't play the game successfully with them, you'd want to step out of the game, which can lead some people to the erroneous conclusion that their advertising dollars are money that's wasted. And rather than finding more efficient methods of advertising or, or selling their business, they tend to withdraw from the market of advertising, which tends to be a... Uh, a catch-22 or a self-fulfilling prophecy. Gary? Well, I think that all retailers in the small towns surrounding, particularly, are going to have to really sharpen up their skills and remember the, to greet the customer, to really be aware of his needs, and go far beyond what sometimes we maybe fail to do, and that is remember that our job is to serve the customer. You can buy merchandise anywhere, but the service that goes along with it can only be given to the degree that a small business can do it, and I think that's where we're going to find our niche. I've been talking with Gary Thompson of longtime Thompson Electric, now Radio Shack in Corning, Iowa, and John McMahon of McMahon's Drugstore. Phil Allen for NFO's Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 110, 3, 2, 1. Let's hear first from a Washington reporter, Ronnie Bronson. She has an update on the Denver-based Farm Credit Association. The good news continued this week for the farm credit system as it reported a combined net income of $176 million for the first quarter of 1989. That's up $11 million from the same period last year. System officials called the first quarter earnings very encouraging. Among the major factors were a 64% increase in net interest income and a gain on sales of other property owned. Also significant was the negative provision for loan losses made possible by the strong ag economy and improved credit quality in the system's loan portfolio. System officials credited strong farm cash income and the system's loan restructuring program with significant reductions in high-risk loans and non-earning assets. At the same time, officials noted the system continues to streamline operations and reduce operating costs to deliver credit to borrowers at competitive rates. I'm Ronnie Bronson in Washington. The Farm Credit Bank of Omaha had a 52% decrease in earnings in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. We note three things about this credit picture. One, high interest rates do result in more earnings or profits for lenders. Two, farm prosperity is believed to have returned, but government spending was at an all-time high. And three, when interest rates are high, this is a depressing factor for farmers. Interest is one of their important costs. Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about.